Oh, good morning. Oh, it is so nice to be here with you all this morning, and it's so nice to get started. And here's how I wanted to start this morning. I wanted to start by asking you, do you remember your first day of school? Raise your hand if you actually say, yep, I have memories of my very first day of school. Wow, that's impressive. Uh, that is way more than I thought would. Um, see, by this point, I think most kids are back in school. Are there any holdouts left who haven't gone back yet? Just a couple. Okay, that's what I thought. Just a couple left. And this season makes you reflect on maybe your first day of school. And I wonder what you remember, if anything, from your first day. Personally, I don't remember a thing about mine. But here's the picture evidence that it happened. Yeah. We lived in the country in Deer Trail, Colorado. As you can tell, my mom dressed me. My forehead has only gotten bigger since then. And that belt buckle, actually, is a participation trophy belt buckle for Mutt and Bustin, which I came in last in. So if you ever think I'm soft, it's not really my fault. Um, what I wanted to ask you is, parents, what was harder for you? Your first day of school or your kid's first day of school? What was harder? Kids. And why was it hard? Because of separation anxiety, to let them go. See, we are scared to be separated from our kids, and as a, as a kid, you are scared to be separated from your parents. Now, parents, I know this changes later, and you are just like trying to get them to go back to school, like you're counting down the days until they have to go back. But I want you to think back to either how hard it was for you to be separated from your parents, or parents, how hard it was for you to be separated from your kids for the first time. And this morning, I wonder if you've ever felt separated from God. I wonder if maybe you felt like God was not there for you. That maybe God turned his back on you. Or maybe you feel like God was asleep or just didn't care about you. But that's not the case. That's not what we just read. That's not Paul's argument at all. In fact, Paul is telling us the exact opposite. So our big idea this morning is this. If you are in Christ, nothing can ever separate you from the love of God. If you are in Christ, nothing ever will be able to separate you from the love of God. And so this morning we come to this, the climax of this amazing letter. But first, let's review where we have been, right? In the first three chapters, if you don't remember, Paul tells us that there are no good people that all people are sinful and broken. In chapters 4 and 5, we learn that you can only be justified if you are in Christ. And if you remember in chapter 4, it says that even Abraham was justified by his faith. In chapter 6, we learn that once we are in Christ, we no longer have to pursue our sin, but we are now able to pursue God. But in chapter 7, Paul tells us that even though he's in Christ, he still struggles with sin, saying, I do the things I don't want to do. And chapter 8 is about the beauty of salvation and living life in the Spirit. And so here's the end of chapter 8, and we come to perhaps the most amazing prose in all of Scripture. I would say this is the most amazing prose in the entire Bible. There was this Welsh preacher named Martin Lloyd-Jones, and he served in Westminster Chapel in London, in the 1900s, and I have to say that because somebody's like, 1900s, that's so old, that's so long ago. Well, he, and he said this, he said, preaching is logic on fire. And we see the most incredible logic this morning. If you are a skeptic and you think Christians are dumb, I want you to notice the brilliance of Paul's argument this morning. What Paul does is he asks five rhetorical questions to solidify his point. Five questions we face as Christians and five struggles you have likely faced as a Christian, but one incredible answer that provides us with complete assurance. So let's jump in. Verse 31, 
What shall we say about such wonderful things as these? If God is for us, who can ever be against us? Okay, look at that phrase. What shall we say about such wonderful things as these? What is he referring to? He's going back to verse 28, which says this. We know that all things work together for the good of those who love God and are called according to his purpose. For those he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son, so that he would be the firstborn among many brothers and sisters. And verse 30, And those he predestined, he also called. And those he called, he also justified. And those he justified, he also glorified. Whoa. In theology, we call this the golden chain of salvation. That this is how salvation works. And how this works is every part of this chain has to be true. Not only one part of this chain is true, but it's all true. So if you have been justified, then you will be glorified. Hence the past sense of the word glorified. Because if you have been saved, God's going to take you through to the very end. And so this is what Paul's talking about. Is, is there any better news than this? No. So look back at verse 31. What shall we say about such wonderful things as these? If God is for us, who can ever be against us? See, remember, the wonderful things Paul is referring to here is that we are chosen, called, justified. There's nothing better than this. And so that brings us to our first question this morning, that second part of verse 31. If God is for us, then who can ever be against us? And this is a question regarding opposition. We know Christians have faced incredible opposition throughout history. Even think about the persecution that's happening to the church while Paul is writing this letter. Think about this. Within 10 years, we think, roughly, within 10 years of Paul writing this letter, Paul is martyred in the very city he's writing to. He is beheaded in Rome by the order of Nero. Sounds like opposition to me. Paul is not saying we will not face opposition. And you know this. Today, Christians face a new and growing opposition. I know you know this. Especially amongst our younger generations. In student ministry, we talk about this a lot. Especially for our kids who go to public school. You know, a couple months ago, I asked them, particularly the kids who go to public school, who feel like black sheep because they're a Christian in their environment, right? And I asked them, when you tell your peers or your friends that you're a Christian, what's their response? And do you know what their top response was? They think I'm stupid. They think I'm naive. They think I'm illogical. And maybe you're here this morning, and you are skeptical of Christianity, and you think some of these things about Christians. But I want you to notice that Paul's argument is none of these things. It's logical. It's not naive. In fact, I would go as far to say that what's naive is to look at the state of the world and say, yeah, I think deep down inside everyone's a good person. Just really deep down inside. I think what's naive is to say, be true to yourself as if somehow, some way, you are the supreme source of what's good. That's naive. Do you know last year, in the United States, we had a record year for suicides? 50,000 people committed suicide last year. The year before, 2021, was a record year for overdose deaths. 106 people died of overdose in 2021. And today, we face a loneliness epidemic, which is especially present in men. Maybe you remember... When Jeff was teaching earlier this summer, he shared this stat that 15% of men say they do not have a single friend. Not one. That's why this church family is so important. We need each other. But the point is, the point I'm trying to make is culture by and large wants to ignore the brokenness we see today. And what Paul is describing in Romans is not naivete, but everlasting divine wisdom. And in that wisdom, he's saying that God is our only solution to our brokenness. And in that wisdom, he's saying Christians will face opposition. The point is that even though we face opposition, it does not compare to our Lord who is for us, right? And this is the idea. 
if the God of the universe is for you, you're going to be just fine. You're going to be fine. But how does he prove that he's for us? By giving us his son. Do you know that God the Father rejected God the Son on the cross? Do you know this? Look at this. So this is Matthew 27, 46. This is Jesus talking. He says, My God, my God, why have you abandoned me? See, when Jesus was on the cross, God the Father poured out the wrath of God on his own Son. And in theology, we call this penal substitution, that Jesus took upon our penalty himself. He was our substitute. He died the death we deserved, and he took our penalty. On Tuesday, there was a memorial service for a pastor named Tim Keller. And Keller once said this. He said, Out of all the humans who have ever lived throughout history, Jesus Christ alone lived the perfect life we should have lived. He alone earned the divine blessing that, a, that such a life would merit. And then he died the death we should have died, taking the curse and punishment we deserve. He did all of these things in our place. Because he was treated as we deserve, we can be treated by God as Jesus deserves. And this is salvation by sheer grace and gift. This is what we call the scandal of grace. That it's backwards. Jesus took our spot. It wasn't supposed to be this way. That was my penalty. But Jesus took it upon himself. So we can know that God is for us because he gave us his son. Question number two. If God gave us his son, won't he give us everything else? This is a question of deprivation. Look at verse 32. Since he did not spare even his own son, but gave him up for us all, won't he also give us everything else? Okay, do not misunderstand this. What Paul's describing here is not the prosperity gospel at all. He's not saying that. In fact, the thought is if the father gave us his most valuable possession— then what would he withhold from us? Nothing. The Father is going to give us all of the benefits of sonship, daughtership, our inheritance. He's not going to withhold anything from us. And we will live in the new heavens and the new earth completely glorified. All right, pay attention. Look at this word spare. This word spare is supposed to make us think of something. It's supposed to make us think back to Genesis 22 and Abraham. In fact, when we translate the Hebrew Old Testament into Greek, this is the word we see used in Genesis 22, verse verse 12. And real quick, here's the story. It's Abraham being willing to sacrifice Isaac. And if you don't know, Abraham was a pagan who lived in the land of Ur. He likely worshipped the sun. That's likely what he was doing. He was not looking for God, but God was looking for him. And God picked him to be the father of a great nation from which all the nations of the earth would be blessed. And who's that fulfilled in? That's fulfilled in Jesus Christ. But the problem is that Abraham and Sarah are old and they don't have any children. But God promises that he will provide a son. But in their waiting, they take matters into their own hands, and this is the weirdest part of the story. Sarah has this idea that Abraham should have a child with her slave, Hagar. And so Hagar becomes pregnant, And her son's name is Ishmael. But remember, Ishmael is not the child of the promise. So eventually, in her old age, God provided Sarah with a son, the child of the promise, Isaac. And around the time that Isaac's 12 years old, God told Abraham to sacrifice Isaac to him. But remember, Isaac's the child of the promise. Isaac's the way that this is all going to happen. But being obedient, Abraham is prepared to do it. And just as Abraham is about to sacrifice Isaac, he hears this, verse 12. Don't lay a hand on the boy, the angel said. Do not hurt him in any way, for now I know you truly fear God, and you have not withheld, that's the word spare, you have not spared for me even your own son, your only son. See, Abraham loved God so much, he was willing to give him everything, including his son. And God provided a sacrifice. And that's what God did for us. He provided us with the sacrifice. Oh, but Pastor Jake, 
the story is so unfair. It's almost barbaric that God would even ask somebody to be willing to give up their son. Yep, that's the point. Because that's what God did for us. God gave us his son. He did not even spare his son for us. So this is the thought. If God did this for us, then what could deprive us from the love of God? Nothing. Could even our sin deprive us of God's love? No. Nothing can deprive us of God's love. And God will withhold nothing from us. And that brings us to question three. Question three is, who can accuse the elect? This is a question of accusation. And look at verse 33. This is in the CSB. It says, who can bring an accusation against God's elect? God is the one who justifies. And if you think about it, personally, just speaking for myself, lots of people can accuse me of sin. Because I've done lots of people wrong. I have done sinful, terrible things. So lots of people can accuse me of sin, and the accusations, by and large, are probably true. That's not the point. The point, what Paul is saying, is because we have been justified, the accusations no longer stick. My sin and penalty was paid for by Christ on the cross. I've been justified by the sacrifice of Christ. And notice this line. God is the one who justifies. It's God who gives us right standing with himself. It is God who has saved us from the wrath of God. Friends, in addition to this, we also face an enemy. We call Satan the great accuser. And Satan wants to accuse you of all your sins and mistakes, the fact that you're not perfect, and make you question whether God really loves you. You know know how he does this? By sowing seeds of doubt. If you remember, this is what he did in the garden. Did God really say? And so this, this is what it looks like for us. You might have an idea pop into your head that goes like this. Would God really love someone who loses their temper? Would God really love someone so prideful? Would God really love me? You know what the Bible's answer is? Yes! Yes, despite all those things. You're, God loves you despite all of those things. God loves you because you are his. And question four, then who can condemn us? This is a question of condemnation. And look at verse 34. Who is the one who condemns? Christ Jesus is the one who died, but even more, has been raised. He also is at the right hand of God and intercedes for us. See, people may try to condemn us, but we cannot be condemned because we belong to Christ. And sometimes we fall into this trap of thinking that God has condemned us. But that's not the case. That's not what it says here. God has not condemned you. And I think even more common than that is we try to condemn ourselves. See, you look at your shortcomings in life and think, this is too great for God to love me. Friends, what's greater? The work of sin in your life or the work of Christ? What's greater? The work of the enemy in your life or the work of Christ? Pastor Jake, I've turned my back on God. He didn't turn his back on you. Pastor Jake, I ran from God. He didn't run from you. You remember the prodigal son story? When the father represents our heavenly father, and when the prodigal returns, what does the father do? And runs out to meet him. God didn't run from you. God's love is for you before you were for him. Pastor Jake, you don't know the things I've done. You're right. I don't know the things you've done, and I don't need to. I know what God did for you. Do you want to know why I believe Scripture says that no one can lose their salvation? Because your salvation belongs to the Lord. 
Look at this. This is Revelation 7. This is the church worshiping. And it says this, After this I looked and there was a vast multitude from every nation, tribe, people, and language, which no one could number, standing before the throne of the Lamb. They were clothed in white robes with palm branches in their hands, and they cried out in a loud voice, Salvation belongs to our God, who is seated on the throne and to the Lamb. Your salvation belongs to the Lord. What God has started in you, God will finish. Remember the golden chain of salvation. It is all true. God will take you through to the very end. And so this brings us to question number five. Can anything separate us from the love of God? Verse 35. Can anything ever separate us from Christ's love? Does it mean when he no longer loves us if we have trouble or calamity or are persecuted or hungry or destitute or in danger or threatened with death? And notice, Paul's not saying that we won't experience these things. That's not what he's saying at all. His point is, even in these things, we cannot be separated from the love of God. And then verse 36 is so interesting. Look at this. As the scriptures say, for your sake we are killed every day. We are being slaughtered like sheep. Does that seem out of place to you? Like, God loves you, you can't be separated from God's love. God loves you, you can't be separated from God's love. And for your sake, we're, we're dying every day. We're being slaughtered like sheep. <laughs> what is Paul doing here? Why does he quote this? What is he even saying? Well, he's quoting Psalm 44. And Psalm 44 is a very weird psalm. See, most psalms, if you read the psalms, you'll notice that a lot of psalms go like this. God hears this hardship we're going through, and it's really hard, but you give us victory and we praise you. That's kind of the order of most psalms. Psalm 44 is nothing like that. Psalm 44 is an accusation against God. And it's an accusation saying that God's people have been faithful, but God has not been faithful. Let's read this. This is Psalm 44. O oh God, we have heard it with our own ears. Our ancestors have told us of all you did in their day, in the days long ago. You can hear it right away. Of like, we know what you did back then, but you have done nothing for us. You drove out the pagan nations by your power and gave all the land to our ancestors. You crushed their enemies and set our ancestors free. They did not conquer the lands with their sword, and it was not their own strong arm that gave them victory. It was your right hand and strong arm and the blinding light from your face that helped them, for you loved them. You are my king and my God. You command victories for Israel. Only by your power can we push back our enemies. Only in your name can we trample our foes. I do not trust in my bow. I do not count on my sword to save me. You are the one who gives us victory over our enemies. You disgrace those who hate us. O oh God, we give you glory all day long and constantly praise your name. Don't let that trick you. Look how it shifts. But now you have tossed us aside in dishonor. You no longer lead our armies to battle. You make us retreat from our enemies and allow those who hate us to plunder our land. You have butchered us like sheep and scattered us among the nations. You sold your precious people for a pittance, making nothing on the sale. You let our neighbors mock us. We are the object of scorn and derision to those around us. You have made us the butt of their jokes. They shake their heads at us in scorn. We can't escape the constant humiliation. Shame is written across our faces. And all we hear are the taunts of our mockers. All we see are our vengeful enemies. All this has happened, though we have not forgotten you. We have not violated your covenant. Our hearts have not deserted you. We have not strayed from your path. Yet you have crushed us in the jackal's desert home. You have covered us with darkness and death. If we had forgotten the name of our God or spread our hands in prayer to foreign gods, God surely would have known it, for he knows the secrets of every heart. But for your sake, we are killed every day. We are being slaughtered like sheep. 
Wake up, O Lord. Why do you sleep? Get up. Do not reject us forever. Why do you look the other way? Why do you ignore our suffering and oppression? We collapse in the dust lying face down in the dirt. Rise up. Help us. Ransom us because of your unfailing love. And for 800 years, the psalm stood. I just picture them, the Jews in synagogue, reading this psalm for 800 years. Saying, we see what you did for our ancestors, God, but where are you now? Where are you now, God? Why are you asleep, God? And I wonder if you have ever felt this way. So why on earth does Paul stop and quote this psalm? To make the point that God responded on the cross. The cross is the answer. God was never asleep, and he's never been asleep in your life. He's been working all things for good. He wasn't asleep, he didn't turn his back on you, and he didn't leave you. Look at verse 37. This is the answer. This is Paul's answer. He says, no, despite all these things, overwhelming victory is ours through Christ who loved us. Friends, we live in the victory and the love of Christ. God was not asleep. God did not turn his back on you. God did not leave you. No, God loved you before you loved him. And look at verse 38. And I am convinced that nothing can ever separate us from God's love. Neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither our fears for today nor our worries about tomorrow, not even the powers of hell can separate us from God's love. Nothing can separate us from the love of God. Not even our future can separate us from God's love. I hope you caught that. You see where it says, neither our fears for today nor our worries about tomorrow? Not even our future. How many of you are history nerds like I am? Raise your hand. Yep, out yourself. Yep. How come we watch history documentaries different than we watch the news? Like, I know for a fact that none of you freak out when you see Hitler invade Poland. Why? You know how it ends. You know how it ends. You know what happens. So does God. So does God. So nothing can separate you from the love of God, not even your future. Your future is known to God, and not even your future can separate you from the love of God. And look at verse 39. No power in the sky above or in the earth below, indeed nothing in all creation will ever be able to separate us from the love of God that is revealed in Christ Jesus our Lord. Nothing. Nothing can separate us from the love of God. And I want you to notice this line that says, nothing in all of creation, or as other translations say, nothing that's been created. You know, a common question that will pop up from this passage is, what about me? Can I separate myself from the love of God? Like, Pastor Jake, I get it. No outside force can separate me from the love of God. But what about myself? Can I separate myself from the love of Christ? No. Because you fall into this category, you are a created being. You cannot even separate yourself from the love of Christ. Pinecrest, this is the great climax of this letter. Romans is Paul's take on the gospel, and here's the big takeaway. If you are in Christ, nothing can ever separate you from the love of God. Nothing. And there's no better news. Now, I want to end... By telling you a story I heard a pastor named Dr. York tell when he taught on this text. And the story goes like this. There was a man named Robert Bruce who was a pastor in Scotland in the 1500s and the 1600s. And he was a descendant of Robert the Bruce, hence his name of Robert Bruce. But Robert Bruce was a pastor. In July 1631, his health began to deteriorate just because of old age. And on July 27th, he started his day as he did every day. And every day, he had his daughter make him one egg for breakfast. And so he started this day, just as he did every day, with his one egg for breakfast. 
But he ate his egg, and then he told his daughter, Daughter, I feel especially hungry this morning. Will you please make me a second egg? And so the daughter begins working and cooking that second egg. And as she's cooking the second egg, he falls into this meditation. He's just kind of out of it. And he's just totally silent. And all of a sudden, he yells out, Hold, daughter, hold. My master calleth me. And with that, he became blind. And so his whole family now gathers around him, knowing that the end is near. And he asked them to bring him the family Bible. So they bring the family Bible, and he asked them to open it up to Romans 8, which they did. And once they had it open to Romans 8, he asked them to put his hands on these last two verses. He asked his family, Are my fingers touching these words? And I am convinced that nothing in all creation will ever be able to separate us from God's love, neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither are fears for today nor are worries about tomorrow. Not even the powers of hell can separate us from God's love. No power in the sky above or in the earth below, indeed nothing in all creation will ever be able to separate us from the love of God that is revealed in Christ Jesus our Lord. Are my fingers touching these words? And they said yes. And with that, his last words were, Well, then God be with you, my children. I have breakfasted with you today, and I shall sup with my Lord Jesus this night. Pinecrest. The confidence and assurance Robert Bruce had is the same confidence and assurance you can have. What the Holy Spirit just said through Paul assures us that one day we too will sup with the Lord. Because nothing can separate us from the love of God. Amen?